And we are live. You're watching Fantastic Fiction at KGB. Uh, I I don't even know what I'm saying. I'm here with Ellen <laughs> Batlow. My name is Matthew Kressel. And tonight's guests are Jeff Ford and Karen Warren, uh, two of my favorite Karen, actors, he's seriously. I hate yeah. them both. Uh, yeah. uh, so I'm yeah. going to name the Dambalai so people don't get confused. Here too. That's good. We're, we're gonna, it's going to be a few minutes before we do the uh, the reading. So we're just hanging out now, chatting, having oh, you can see the back of You can see my new display case. <laughs> Tell us about your display case. It was delivered two Fridays ago. So I got it and I put things in it. You can see. It looks very good. It looks nice. I haven't seen it in person yet, but it looks good. Well, no one's seen it in person except the people who put it in. Right. <laughs> yes, I can have I can have company, but I have no place for anyone to sit except two kitchen chairs and a folding chair, two folding chairs. I have to get a couch eventually. But after I get my desk, which I probably won't get for another month, but it's coming along. Yeah. Yeah. And I got an extension, thank God, for my best of the year. It was due Monday, this past Monday. But I have until April 1st, but I'm going to finish it within a week. I swear to God, I want it out of my life. And <laughs> I'm surrounded by, oh, someone was asking me, I was inter just interviewed for my bookstore for some spotlight thing. And they said, what do you surround, how do you surround yourself with I've got books piled up and magazines piled up and papers over there and drinks over here and, you know, and crap all over the place. <laughs> but other than that, you know, and that's my... But you manage to keep track of it all? I do, usually. Yeah, I yeah. usually don't lose anything. Hello, Hi. Carol. Hello, Amy. Hello, Hi, Luke. Luke. Thanks, uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, this is Fantastic Fiction to KGB. We, uh, we usually start a few minutes early just to kind of let people come in the bar, so to speak. Hi. Uh, so, yeah, we're hanging out. My wife is home. Hey there. Okay. <laughs> and Jack joined us. A yeah. He left. He'll be back probably. So I've set myself up a little fake bar at the back there, even though it's nine o'clock in the morning for me, or ten o'clock in the morning. She's not drinking. I'm not drinking. But Are I thought those I'd get the actual drinks, or is it just props? No, it's you actual got some drinks. booze back there. Yeah. Oh. Well, there's some like really nice anodized. Uh, Hi everybody. I have a um, uh, what did I say? It's a chocolate, stout? organic chocolate stout. Is it Samuel Smith's? Yes. Yeah, that's good stuff. It's good. I like, I like this. I would buy a bottle in Trader Joe's and hang on to it for a while. I got a big mug of gin. <laughs> yeah, nice. <laughs> All right. That is a very big mug. I have to, Maybe I've you got, should read first, Jeff. If you, I've just got straight vodka. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Yeah. Hi, hello. That's what Australian water is basically vodka. I don't know if you guys know that, but they can true. hear us, right? They it comes out of the tap. Can Who can hear, hear us? Everybody can hear you. I thought. Okay. But, yeah, but we but we can't. Um, type to them. Well, you could, but I think it's no, better. No, no, don't. It's all right. It's okay. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Hey, Jenny. Yes, hey. Um, I'm drinking hey, Darkness Beneath by Casey BC. It's an Imperial Stout. It's really nice. Mm -hmm. It's like that does look pretty good. Like it wine. does look like red wine, doesn't it? Yeah. I have yeah. the bottle, but I probably won't drink anymore tonight. <laughs> Go oh. on, Ellen. No, it'll give me a Heartburn, you know. How about if you? How about if you two drink every time Jeff and I swear? Okay. <laughs> how about if I swear? Yeah. <laughs> you have to drink twice if you swear. My Talk wife's doing handstands. Talking is best for you. <laughs> yes, that's okay. No, it, it's not. Too, it's too early for Karen. It's far too early for me. J, J S, you're in Australia too, right, Jen? She's asking us too yeah, early. early for chocolate stout. <laughs> Dan, it is definitely too, well. Look, it may be not too early for you. It's not too early for um, a mimosa. I could have done a mimosa, I suppose. A mimosa would have been good. Yeah, Bloody Mary. Do they do Bloody Mary? Oh my gosh, I love Bloody Marys. Yeah, I should yeah, have I done do myself too. a Bloody Mary. Well, I hate yeah. the atheists. So. There's still time. We we we're not going to do the readings <laughs> for another ten minutes. <laughs> I could wake my son up. He's asleep. I could wake him up and make me make me one. Yeah. <laughs> I do love a good Bloody Mary. In fact, I said last time I was in the States, I sampled them everywhere I went. I tried to. This is Did you Karen. have a favorite? Anyone? Oh, yeah, that book. Did you have a favorite? Oh, there's Tool Tales. Is oh, that, let me that? think. I did, actually. I think it was the hotel I stayed in in Washington. 
was my, I can't remember which hotel it was now, but they, he did a marvellous one for me. Uh, I think he was, I think the barman was actually a bit. Hi, TLJ. I don't know. Anyway, it was a very good, strong Bloody Mary, let's put it that way. Okay. Best Bloody Mary I ever had. The secret ingredient was anchovies. They like yeah. ground up anchovies. I know it sounds disgusting, but it yeah. was actually really good. Had a nice bit of salt in us. I went and had one at that bar in New York that says that they invented them. There is not the Regent, something like that. The Regis, the Regis bar, who reckon they invented it. And that okay. was pretty cool. That Ellen, you would love. Have you been in that bar? They've got like across one massive wall in New York, one massive wall. They've got the creepiest Isn't painting of world? old King Cole. Yes, you've ever seen. Yeah, no, I don't. The King, it's famous. I went there. It was a famous publishing bar. I don't know if it right. still exists. But well, yeah. it was still there last time I was in New York. What do they have there? A famous painting? Yeah, huh? Old King Cole. Yeah. That's and it's probably, the is creepiest it by, thing uh, you have ever cool. seen. Oh, wait a second. Isn't it by, is it by, uh, what's his name? The guy who did. Um, Not Maxfield Parish? Parish. That's who I was thinking. Probably. I don't know. I don't know. Google so it. So cool Maybe. and so terrifying. Like Old King Cole is this malevolent thing sitting there and all these. <laughs> oh, it's fabulous. Anyway, I had a Bloody Mary <laughs> there and it was. Eh. <laughs> But the bar was great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But anchovies, I don't know. I actually don't like that. Is there well, saltiness like somehow? Really interesting. It was salty, but it had like, yeah, I guess a briny taste to it. It was almost like, uh, hmm. yeah, like, you know, like miso has that like briny, salty flavor. Mm. That's disgusting. It good. <laughs> it sounds, I know, it sounds gross. But it, was, it was quite that good. It sounds good to me because I don't like, I hate V8. V8 juice. Mm. Yeah. And that's what Bloody Marys remind me of. Yeah, I don't I love all that typically too. like I don't really like spicy alcohol. I like mimosas. Mimosas are good. Because they go yeah. down just like orange juice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I like really good homemade sangria. Yeah. Bloody Marys, aren't they supposed to like cure your hangover? Oh, oh yeah. if you put an egg, aren't you supposed to put an egg in it for that? Ooh, or something? Man. I don't know. <laughs> The Bloody Mary. Easy enough to drink. <laughs> so it didn't seem that different from, uh, yeah, from anchovies. Oh, yeah. Amy's just said they put Clamato in there. So that's, yeah, that's yeah. like that sort of clammy. Get an anchovy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi, Dave. Hi, Gay. Hey. Thanks for joining us. You're watching Fantastic Fiction at KGB, our 13th live stream since the pandemic. Hi, yeah. Crazy, right? La March. Mar Wait, was it March or was it April? No, it had to be March because that would be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know when we're going to go live again. I mean, it really depends totally on how everyone feels. Yeah. Uh, we haven't scheduled September yet, although, we, you know. <sighs> yeah, I, I mean, from what I'm hearing, the end of May, it's going to be generally available. We'll see, but. Yeah, but that doesn't mean people are going to want to go. Uh <laughs> It's going to take a few months for people to feel comfortable, yeah. and then like the numbers are going to have to go down really low, and people are going to be like, "All right, well, the chances are like." Yeah, I would say not before September. That's for sure. Yeah, probably take the summer off and not off, but do it remote, uh, virtual. Keep it virtual. Yeah, it's been going well. Yeah, I'll have to figure out how to do it when we go back in the bar like i mean it actually feels less stressful for me i guess because i don't feel i have to entertain people as much and um also take pictures and stuff yeah i miss going to the cooper's beforehand i shouldn't tell everyone that on the live stream yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, like yeah like just going you know and having a few drinks like pre-gaming so to speak i miss dan's <laughs> pre loading the day, i used to go to the b bar you know the b bar yeah. Uh, where's that? Yeah. It was on Bowery. Oh. Is that? It's pretty there? close. It's right down the street. I okay. don't know there. I remember going there once. Um, I mean, I yeah, I used to go. They used to have good burgers. Yeah. There was they that, one that outside place. place. Yeah, that you was sit place. outside. I like it. Yeah. Oh, that one, that restaurant, that like. Yeah, that yeah. Hanging lights, whatever. You've no, been don't, there. We've never gone yeah. to that place. Veselka, yeah, Veselka is still well, we never, there. We've never gone to Veselka. I mean, I love Veselka, but we've never gone there after KGB. I heard, well, I heard before I was running it that some people used to go there. Hey, Delia. 
Guys, the, oh, oh, hi, Ellen. Hi, Julia. <laughs> It's oh, Ellen, and she says it's Ellen. Hi, Ellen. <laughs> yeah. Um, Where are you seeing these people, Karen? In our imagination. Just oh, in click the, in the comments. comments on the right. Uh, what com I don't see any comments. Uh, well, you're probably you still on our private chat. Right we... Oh, 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 I see. Yeah. Oh, oh, look at all these people. Yeah, yeah. all these crazy people. What are they doing? Good here? Lord. That's great. There yeah. we go. You've got people saying hi to you, Jeff. I think you're ignoring them. No, no, no. I'm not. I had no idea what was going on. I'm, I'm, going back. I'm, going to, I'm meeting Rick Bozik. Hello, Sorry. everyone. Oh, so I, I should have. Hi, Lizanne. Wait, Amy, the B bar. Wait, what was that dive bar we used to go to after the nurse of readings? It Which closed one? down. Which one? Yeah. It Wait. was the one that had like a pool table and it was. Was that the when? Well, where was Nursef at that time? The art gallery, that oh, art gallery that you go down the stairs. On Ordovers. Oh yeah, I went to that place once. It was so loud, I hated it. Yeah, I you know I just miss I, hanging out with people. Karen, I mean, Ellen, Ellen, we can hear you. I mean, we can't hear you. We can see you. I don't know how Rick Bose is. I haven't talked to him. I've talked to him for the first time today in like a few weeks. I'm having lunch with him next week, and his aide. So I'm guessing he's the same. Yeah, I'll find out. Bill Shun, you you said uh, you remember going to Odessa or Kiev. Amy. Oh Amy, yeah, we went. To, we ate. Oh, God, Kiev. I used to love Kiev. We used to I go there all the time, actually. I went there and yeah. said, at the time the soap was really snotty, and they okay. were with me. They were horrible, so I would go to Kiev. Yeah. Kiev closed, and yeah, Kiev was great. Well, that area is very Ukrainian over there. My wife's family used to go to church over there. Yeah, I really I love Kiev. Hi, Joseph. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for joining us. You're watching Fantastic Fiction at KGB. Uh, we're going to get started in like a little less than five minutes. I keep forgetting I'm in a rocking chair. <laughs> and I just drop, and it must be driving people crazy. When I always put them in a rocking chair, my antique rocking chair. Made by the Pullman Car Company. Company, I got it in North Carolina. It cost more to ship it than it did to buy it. Carol, that, this is just a a, <laughs> a big like a sarong that I'm covering up all my. Wait, shit. The, yeah, wait, wait. I'm sorry. Amy just said the Kiev's owner. Are they the people who owned that building that blew up? That oh, the, that building that blew no, up at the gas leak. Did they blow it up on purpose? No, it was a, it was like they were illegally tapping a gas line. Yeah, and they had a oh, city no. inspection come, and they're like, nice. "Quick, get rid of the tap!" And they did a half-ass job, and the and the thing yeah, blew up. Killed, killed two people. Oh, that's, that's a bit tragic. No, I don't think so. Ellen, what was that place? What was that place? We get the uh, the hot dogs and the coconut champagne. <laughs> oh, remember that shit? Yeah. <laughs> coconut champagne. Like yeah. There's That's what they called it. There's wow. One, you know, I haven't tried it. I need to see if it's any good. Oh, there's one there, really? Yeah. Yeah, right on First Avenue. I have not checked it out, but I but the one that old one is gone. I mean, they eighth street's gone. There was one on 72nd Street and Broadway. I don't know if that one's still there, but yeah, they had the best hot dogs. Oh. And coconut champagne. That sounds gross, actually. Yes, but, but it doesn't the, sound good. I'm I, sorry. <laughs> But were they the people who owned the Kiev? Oh, Amy said it was the people who owned the Kiev were the people responsible for that bomb, that building blowing up. That uh, that that place had those hot dogs that when you bite them they snapped. Yeah, you know? that. that was the best oh, time in heaven. <laughs> I just had salami sandwiches for dinner, kosher salami. I'm I, glad I, it's uh, virtual. <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> For those I, who haven't seen it, my new display case is here. <laughs> I'm very proud of that display case. I am. I'm very, very I proud of it. Totally fill it up. I put a lot of stuff in, but not all the stuff. I can put my tools in there when I find my tools, which are someplace I pack them in a box. That's a good segue to your, your tool book. Yes, the <laughs> tools. Some of the tools are in here. Cool tales. Hold on, let me zoom it for you. Here we go. Oh, look at that. It's a tap, tap book from Australia. And so it's, who are some of the authors in it? 
it's Karen wrote <laughs> micro fictions to pictures of my tools. Yeah. And that's available. You can buy that. It's on it's through the publisher. You can get it on their website, IFWG Publishing Australia, or it'll be on Amazon like in April. I noticed. You can order it. You probably can re pre order it. That's a good fun book, that one. Creepy yeah. too, though. Well, you can look at it on Facebook where I originally posted the whole sure. project. Don't tell people that. <laughs> well, should we get started? I yeah. think so, right? Yeah. Yeah. Let's um, all right. So um, you're watching Fantastic Fiction at KGB, where uh, a monthly reading series held on the third Wednesday of every month. Usually we're at the KGB bar in Manhattan, but uh, we've been doing it virtually. This is our 13th month which is kind of crazy um the series started in in late um the late 90s i think and uh it's been going for a long time it's had a lot of different hosts ellen and i are the latest um yeah so uh just a couple uh quick things here so the bar itself uh you know everything's closed in new york city right or most things are closed um, it's a great bar. You know, I say this every month, but it's just we want to support the bar. So if you can um, well, donate, you know, the cost of a drink or, a, a, you know, soft or hard, whatever that you would like five bucks if you can to keep them going. It's a great, um, great venue. They have like readings almost every night of the week normally and like poetry readings and, you know, literary events. And, uh, you know, it's actually... Um, Dan, the bartender, was telling me that that um, chefs, you know, when the restaurants were were open, would go there after hours after they work to have a drink. It's it's like a great bar. Like anybody who's ever been there is like this is this is an awesome bar, and um, we want to keep it going for a while until you know, we get back. Until we get back, yeah, absolutely. So hopefully that's going on soon. Uh, the other thing is that the, uh, the series itself, our series, there's a link here. Uh, it costs us a little bit of money to run each month. So, um, you know, we, we give the authors a stipend. Um, we have to pay for um, streaming services and um, we give the KGB bar money each month. Uh, and also when we were doing it in person, we would take the guests out for dinner. We can't do that now, unfortunately, uh, but we can, you know, cheers to them. <laughs> um, but yeah, so if, if, uh, if you, feel like you want to uh, donate, uh, you can use that link right there. That would be awesome. Uh, but donation is not required. Um, yeah, so so um, tonight's readers are, are Jeffrey Ford and Karen Warren. And um, Karen's going to be our first reader. Karen is uh, Shirley, Karen, Shirley Jackson Award winner Karen Warren published her first story in 1993 and has had fiction in print every year since. She has published five multi-award winning novels, including The Grief Hole, currently under development, and seven short story collections. Her most recent books are the novella Into Bones Like Oil and the chapbook Tool Tales with Ellen, which you just saw. Um, she was recently given the Peter McNamara Lifetime Achievement Award. Here's Karen Warren. Thanks, Matt. Oh, look, it's great to be a part of KGB reading still. Obviously, I wish we were all there, but uh, this is as close as we get at the moment. So it's lovely to see all of your faces and hear all your, your words and things down the side of the, in the chat and the comments. So, so I'm going to read a story called The Calentia. Um, and it's in a book called Of Gods and Globes, uh, published by Lancelot Schubert, uh, who I met when I was there in 2018 for World Fantasy. Um, and he was talking about this anthology, uh, which brings together the gods and the planets that uh, affect them and that they have an effect on. And I was just absolutely fascinated by that and started thinking about it back then and then wrote this story for him. <clears throat> the Calentia. The city is cold, full of echoes, empty of people in the chill night. All of them warm inside, windows double glazed so they can watch the spectacle of the geysers at any time, moonlight permitting. Long-term residents claim they never got tired of it. 
Gary watched from his hotel room, looking out over a series of mud pools, and if he concentrated, he thought he could hear them bubbling. Certainly from where he stood, he could see them, the incessant boiling thickness. He was tempted, as always, to dip a toe in, to plunge in, to somehow climb over the protective walls and some of them laughably meagre and dive. A dive in that hot mud would stop his heart. Gary drove into the parking lot of the enormous Rotorua Palladium Convention Centre, pulling right up near the entry. He hoped for a disabled spot there, but they were full, something he should have been prepared for. Unlike others, he could walk if he had to, although every step brought him pain. He parked his car, pulling forward as he always did, because turning his head hurt too much and at times brought on minor seizures. He didn't regret coming alone, though. He didn't want any helpers for this. He wanted to meet Athena on her own, without anyone whispering in his ear, telling him he was foolish, he should save his money, this was a waste of time. Those who didn't suffer chronic pain had no understanding, none of those who did. The car park was well lit at least, needed on this dark night. As he approached the massive metal doors, they opened towards him. Others were headed there too, and in his haste to beat them through the door, he hated to wait for others. He elbowed a young woman who sucked her breath in and held it. Sorry, he muttered. She held her elbow as if he'd drawn blood, and he felt a moment of irritation at her. The foyer was full, thriving with people, and he stood for a moment, planning out his pathway. He could see the others who'd entered alongside him doing the same thing, all of them looking for the easiest way towards the hall, the one that would cause the least interruption and pain. He stepped aside to give himself time to think, pausing by a massive statue. There was one on either side of the doorway. One was Pallas Athena, with shield, weapon and a piercing, intelligent gaze. One was Pallas, whose statue had kept Troy safe and who stood now stooping, considerate, protective. Both looked powerful, strong, healthy. Quotes beneath the statue said, as we guard, so shall we protect as you protect us. The foyer was lined with tables covered with merchandise, bottles of Rotorua mud, packets of Epsom salts and balms. There were symbolic items in the name of Athena, small owl statuettes, decorative weapons, tiny, shiny rocks of palladium, which seemed to glow, examples of local crafts, olive oils, serving platters in the shape of her shield. There were craft objects too, knitted tea cosies, small cardigans, baby clothes, scarves. A soundtrack of owl call comforted him, but he didn't like the beautiful bird caged in the corner. He had a glimpse of himself acting out a moment of great heroism, letting the bird free, but he looked at the low-hanging chandeliers, the tightly closed doors, and could see at once it wouldn't go well. On the walls were posters, blissful depictions of people free from pain, in contrast to those wracked with it, anxious and cringing from the world. Around him, people clustered around the doorways as if it was nearly time to go in. Conversations began amongst the strangers, all of them with something in common. He could hear them sharing their stories about what bit hurt and how long it had hurt for and what the doctor, who didn't believe them, had said. They all had the same story and he was tired of hearing about it. He was tired of telling it. That was why they were all here. The call went out that the session would begin soon. Have your tickets ready, staff called out. They were all dressed in impossibly green t-shirts and were tall, healthy, strong. They moved through the foyer effortless, effortlessly, helping others negotiate the obstacles. Tickets ready, they called. Gary had his. It had cost him the better part of 200 bucks and he checked his pocket periodically to make sure it was still there. Then they were inside. It was a smaller venue than Athena usually played, only 500 seats. Gary hoped this wouldn't affect the way she treated them. Sometimes people would play small venues as if they were doing you a favour. He didn't think Athena would be this way. He'd seen her in Sydney and in Auckland. He'd watched her a thousand times online. She'd never been anything but magnificent. They took their seats. 
He was four rows from the front, right in the middle, but the seats were further apart than usual, so there was little difficulty getting through. People smiled at each other, they touched hands, they made room. He took his seat next to a woman in her 40s, great bags under her eyes, but those eyes were clear, blue, beautiful. Gemma, she said, Gary. They nodded at each other, but he was not keen on conversation. He wanted to immerse himself, be ready. The lights dimmed, the crowd hushed. Any time that someone spoke, the rest would shush them and people would laugh. Gary laughed along with them. There was a sense of camaraderie here he had not felt since his school days when the football team would play and everybody would come out and support. Some knitted or crocheted, wanting to keep their hands active. Others sat still. In the silence, the clicking of needles was strangely comforting. Music played, the owl sounds from the foyer, then a spotlight on stage and Athena was carried in, sitting cross-legged on her shield. Her porters were enormous, wearing skin-tight shirts that shimmered like silver. Rumour had it the shield was covered in skins, although stories differed as to where the skin was from. He'd heard the skin of a giant she'd killed or that of a best friend killed in a terrible accident. He'd heard she used the foreskins of lovers, many, many lovers. All of it fanciful, of course. This was not the real goddess, but simply a wonderful woman who played the part to perfection. On stage behind her was projected the asteroid, Pallas, her spiritual guide, her link, her influence, silverish, beautiful, almost magnetic. The porters turned her so she faced the audience and placed the shield on a sturdy plinth. She unfurled her legs and crossed one over another like a glamorous actress. She was so close, Gary could look straight into her steel grey eyes and his insides turned to liquid. Welcome to Rotorua, land of hot steam, hotter mud, healing. Welcome to your salvation. Welcome to the war on pain. The room erupted. Gary forgot his pain and Gemma jumped at her feet, wincing slightly but carrying on, her arms in the air cheering. We're going to take your pain away, Athena said, because we believe that pain exists. We know it's there. The man next to Gary began to cry out, oh, God, he said, oh, God, oh, thank you. She hasn't done anything yet, someone called out, the tone clearly joking, and the audience laughed. Look beside you, in front of you. These are your people. You can lean on each other. You will help each other. Beside me are my uncle and my cousins who will help you to rest, to be calm. The audience cheered, waved their fingers in the air. Some clapped. We are family. We are all family, all bonded under Pallas. Behind her, the beautiful slideshow began of the asteroid Pallas, silvery, magnetic, and its orbit. Pallas provides an influence on us, those of us who matter, every 1,686 days. Think about it. Dates scrolled through every 1,686 days for the last 60 years. Not everyone will experience this. If you haven't, if you can't look at these dates and definitively tell me that something occurred for you on each of them, then this treatment might not work for you. You may not remember that each of these days were good days, less pain, less sorrow, more of the good stuff. They spent time calling out events of their lives and after an hour or so, most people in the room felt they belonged. Some left. You'll have a full refund, Athena told them, but most stayed. Athena began to dance using weapons and her shield, creating something beautiful and yet warlike. Watching her made Gary feel dizzy, hypnotised. He couldn't take his eyes off her. She sang as well, sometimes with music, sometimes without, and Gary felt no pain for many, many hours. When the lights went up sometime after midnight, he blinked, almost blinded. He hadn't felt his body in all that time, so transported had he been. Oh, my God, Gemma murmured, and she reached over and took his hand. He took the hand of his other neighbour, whose name was Jim, and they sat there, not wanting to leave, until the green-shirted staff members began herding them all back outside. They were subdued, slow to go, lingering at the doorway to step back inside. No one wanted it to be over. They were each given a small box containing a piece of palladium labelled Palace Athena's Metal. 
When the invitation came a week later for a reunion at the Waitangi Soda Springs, Gary didn't hesitate. Transport was part of the arrangement, usually something of an issue, and with an upfront payment, a picnic lunch would be provided and as, as, mu as much assistance as required. On the hour-long ride in the large bus, the conversation turned to pain, as it often did, each person wanting, waiting for their turn to tell their story, all of the stories sounding the same by the end. Gary felt drained by it, by the need for sympathy and the boredom of listening to them talk. So he tucked himself up and gazed out the window, shoulders turned away from his seat companion. Will Athena be there? Someone asked. No, she's helping people who are on the next step from you. It's a progression, you know, a slow climb. Gary knew he wanted to be there at the top of the stairs with Athena looking down at the others. They had their picnic lunch first, olives, quiche, elderflower cordial, chunky salad sandwiches, oatmeal cookies. The pool was enormous, room for all, and as they changed into their swimwear, they laughed and joked. Gary was one of the first in the water, desperate to feel the healing warmth around him, and he sank into it up to his chin. The sulphur smell was strong but not unbearable, and he could feel it in his lungs, doing him good. The temperature of the water was hot but easily bearable and he wished he could stay there forever. After 30 minutes or so, though, he began to feel tired, as if his blood had reached the temperature of the water, and he now was the water, ebbing and flowing, light but heavy. He closed his eyes. There was a tap on his shoulder. Time to get out, Gary. We need to head back before it gets dark. This was Gemma. Her hair was damp around her reddened face, and he thought she looked incredibly beautiful. He didn't know if he could say anything, but on the bus, when they were dry and dressed, she slipped her hand into his and squeezed it and laid her head on his shoulder. They listened to Athena over the speakers on the way home. Gary closed his eyes and fell into a semi-sleep with her words in his ears. Under my wing, you will get protection and safety. You will sink into a state of comfort and you will be well. You will need to make the sacrifices of the millennia, the same sacrifices we've been making forever. But these will make you a better person. They will make you well. They will help you win the war on pain. She told them to seek out Pallas and how to do so, how to find that bright asteroid, the one that would draw out the pain, giving metals in their bodies and help them live simpler, more comfortable lives. The next time there were fewer people, hotter water. They covered themselves in mud first, let it dry, then sank into the water. The mud helped them acclimatise. By the time it washed off, they were used to the heat. Simply putting a toe in without the mud would be unbearable. Gary had spent some time living rough on the street back when his mother died and he hadn't yet learned to look after himself. Even now with his job at the supermarket, he was never sure from day to day if he'd have a place to live. So he liked to be clean. Bathing was an integral part of his well-being. When he had access to a shower, even if he could wash his face, he felt far better than if he was dirty. Athena's uncle spoke, his voice slow, sleepy, calming. Have you ever had that feeling that you wanted to throw yourself off a building, in front of a train, off the boat into the deep blue sea? They call that calentia. We call it the desire for wellness. Gary and Gemma sat together every time in progressively hotter waters, progressively thicker mud. Palace would pass over in another three months. They had to be ready. I'd like to have a celebration, Athena said in a video link. Gary and Gemma sat on a couch together, watching it through her laptop. Athena was on the other side of the planet on a retreat and Gary would have given anything to be there with her. Everybody needed to hear her words. Everybody needed to be healed by her. And then, oh, glorious day, Athena came to them again. There are always enemies, even when you think they are not. They present as friends, supporters, and then they call for your blood. This is why we have so many engagements, so many levels before you reach the ultimate. She took individual interviews with each of them. You're taking painkillers again, she said to Gemma. I can see it in your face. Don't surrender to that, Gemma. Stay with me. Stay with me. Athena looked paler, weaker, her eyes a less livid brown. 
the old gods are fighting against the new reality. No one believes in the old gods that we are here. We haven't left. Our influence is everywhere, but so much weaker and weakening by the day. There were 10 of them left from the original group. Gary felt proud to be one of them. He was, without doubt, without any concerns. Gary couldn't stop staring at Athena. He didn't want to be aroused by her, but he couldn't help it. Every time she moved, her whole body seemed to shiver. Her clothing clung, her, clung to her like skin. He wanted to gaze at her without thinking, to hear every word, but he found himself thinking about her naked, covered with mud, with him slowly swapping the mud from her using hot water and her skin emerging reddened, sensitive, available. The other men were the same. Some of the women too and the rest focused on the knitting and hearing her words. He put his arm around Gemma. They had kissed, but she was so nervous of it, so terrified, he hadn't tried any harder. She told them all about her father, how he'd ruined her for love, she said. And while she didn't say how he'd ruined her, it didn't take much to guess. Her mother had killed him and not gone to jail for it. That's how bad it was. Athena said, the body is a tomb, titanically evil on the outside, divine on the inside. We need to free the soul from the body. We need to free you from the confines of your painful surrounds. Her uncle and her cousins hummed rhythmically, making Gary feel so sleepy he could barely keep his eyes open. He didn't want to miss a single word. He wished they'd be quiet. Athena said, just as I had Cadmus bury dragon's teeth to produce soldiers, so shall you become soldiers. With the influence of Pallas, you will be changed forever. You will not be who or what you are now. You will be my soldiers in my army. A great roar at that, a great excitement. Why is she pretending to be weak? Gemma whispered to Gary. He looked at her aghast. You can't say that. She gives us everything. The others in the room rose in anger, furious. Why are you here? They shouted at Gemma, pushing her, poking her, wanting her gone. Gary wanted her gone too, although she had made him the happiest he had been in a long time. He hesitated, then finally joined them in pushing Gemma away. Thank you for your fury, Athena said. We need that, but you can calm it now. We have removed the last one. We are down to the best, the strongest, the good men and women, my dear, dear soldiers. Gary lay on his back beside the mud pool that was so hot every breath was painful. He gazed up at the star-filled sky. Pallas was there, so bright he had no difficulty picking it out. It was beautiful, so beautiful he cried. You've sent your messages, Athena's uncle asked. You've told people you are going on retreat. You need to be in a medically induced coma to withstand the heat and there will be some time of recovery afterwards. I have, Gary said, and the others too. Athena called out their names, making it sound like an epic poem for all those before you and for you she called hundreds of names Gary thought so many of them her uncle moved amongst them injected them gently no more pain no more pain Athena sang my magnificent dragon's teeth cross the river with me cross over cross over cross over the body is a tomb see you when I wake up Gary said. He wondered if she would love him when he awoke from this coma, once the mud was washed off and he was new and brave, strong and magnificent. She said, there was only a thin casing for the soul. It can be stretched into a new body. The greater the soul, the greater the new body. But she winked. She winked. Rise, my dragon's teeth, Athena said. Pallas, shiny, silvery, bright, passed close by as it did every 4.6 years, drawing out metals, drawing the soldiers out of their mud and to their feet. The soldier rose, feeling no pain, feeling nothing, coated in mud, shining and silvery, a second skin. Where flesh was, metal was now, layer by layer under the influence of Pallas. They began to march, palladium army, pure instinct or memory of movement, led by Athena, their goddess, their commander. It wouldn't hurt a bit.
And that's the end. That's nice. <laughs> Very nice. Very I like nice. admiring your necklace. What is your necklace? Oh, oh it's birds. Oh. It's like it's birds really all funny. connected in a little flock. Yeah. Someone said it looked like Escher birds. I thought they did. Yeah. yeah. It does yeah. a bit. Yeah. You can probably see something in the gaps as well, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Great so story. That's really good. So, can you tell us about that anthology? You yeah, What's that? The anthology. Oh, so, Lancelot Schubert. Yeah. He's the poet and writer and novelist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and he just brings it out. He just bought it out himself. It's a beautiful looking book. It's number two in this series. I believe there was a, another another one as well. But yeah, it's a it's such a good. I love this book. Lots of really interesting stories in there. That's a when great story you read. I really enjoyed yeah. it. Yeah. Thanks, Jeff. Absolutely. When did the book come out? Um, about last oh, year. Yeah. yeah, five or six months ago, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Great. Okay. All right, so we're going to take like a really short break, like three to five minutes, and then we'll be back with Jeff Ford. So yeah. hang hang on, hang around. We'll be back. Go away. Matt, yeah. Can I turn my camera off? I just want to You're go out for a minute. Off. You're going to be turning Yeah, I'm going to, I'll turn everybody off right now. Okay. I'm, all right. We'll be back in five okay. minutes. Be back Great in five. Great reading. Everybody good? Yep. Yeah. yeah. We're Let's here. Just give another minute or two for okay. people are had to get up. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I really enjoyed that, Karen. That was very oh. interesting. Oh, thank you. Rotorua, I've been there. Yes. Yes. Rotorua mud. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, because I had that, I was in the States. Um, at uh, Chicago and then Grand Rapids, and then I went almost straight from there over to New Zealand. So it's like a combination of all those mm -hmm. travels, basically the last time I travelled. Right, right. But yeah, the mud's amazing and the bubbling mud and the smell of it and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I love it. And that whole great, concept great. of a cob. Yep. Tell me when we want to start. No, I, I mean, I think it's probably good to start. Well, what I'm going to do is say what we have several readers coming up over the next few months. We have um, April 21st, we have Nalo Hopkinson and Bruce McAllister. Uh, May 19th, we have Angela Slater, Slater and Rebecca Roanhorse. June 16th, we have Nadja Balkin and Sean and McGuire. July 21st, we have Kim Stanley Robinson and Nancy Kress. And August 18th, we have AC Wise and TK. Wow. <laughs> Famous Hi. TK. Yes. <laughs> and uh, so our next reader 
is Jeffrey Ford, who is the author of several novels and novellas, including The Physiognomy, Memoranda, The Beyond, The Portrait of Mrs. Charbouk, The Girl in the Glass, The Cosmology of the Wider World, The Shadow Year, The Twilight Pariah, Ahab's Return, and Out of Body. His short fiction has been published in numerous magazines and anthologies and in six collections. His work has won the World Fantasy, the Edgar Allan Poe, the Shirley Jackson, Nebula, and other awards. His most recent collection, Big Dark Hole will be out from Small Beer Press this July. Please welcome Jeffrey Ford. Hello, everybody. Thanks for showing up. Chris Dykeman is asking about Peps. She's right here, laying right next to me. I was trying to get her on TV before, but she uh, she was reluctant. Um, I'm delighted uh, to be able to read with Karen. She's one of my favorite writers and people uh, tonight, so it's a thrill. Uh, I'm going to read a story from uh, this collection that's coming out in July. Uh, it's supposed to have come out in March, but they switched it. So, you know, um, I'm going to get started. This is the title story from the collection. It's called Big Dark Hole. The school and its fields that are the basic setting of this story don't exist anymore. They were turned into a housing development about 40 years ago. I suppose most of the teachers, if not all, are dead. The principal, Mr. Tory, who had a habit of rubbing his throat like the ghost of a hangman, collapsed in the 15 items or less aisle at the King Cullen grocery store five years after I graduated high school. A guy who'd been in the math class I'd failed twice and he failed along with me, I forget his last name, but his first name was Jeeb, told me about Tori's demise at a party one night while we were sharing a joint in the basement of this girl's house. He told me Tori suddenly leaned against the checkout counter like he'd been punched in the gut, and on his way to the floor croaked, why? Sewer Pipe Hill lay at the edge of the woods, a pregnancy of Mark, Mar I'm sorry, Sewer Pipe Hill lay at the edge of the woods, a pregnancy of naked dirt that rose out of the ground and was a perfect launching spot to test our racers. We made go-karts with bicycle training wheels, old baby carriage wheels, the wheels from shopping carts, and wooden milk cartons with one side banged out for a seat, rope for steering, and two-by-fours rescued from the demolition of the dead witch's shack deep in the woods where the sassafras grew. When we took the boards from a partially dismantled home, we set what was left standing on fire and ran like only we could through the trails and over the fallen trees through the sticker bush tunnels. The witch was in my dreams after that for a while. She really did look like a witch, pimply face and a long nose. She yelled at us in a foreign language and came out of her place with her cane and kerchief and long coat to chase us. When we were just about out from under the trees and sprinting across the school fields, I always heard her laugh, an urgent bird call, an icy hand on the back of my neck. How long had she lived there? A long, long time. The races we made weren't too fast, and they invariably crashed at the bottom of the south slope of the hill, where it dipped into a three-foot straight drop. It wasn't about who had the best time, but who had the most glorious crash. My brother was in the lead because he was the most dramatic, whereas Bill Gorman and Laurel Manzo survived worse hits and wipeouts. My brother screamed, flailed his arms as he fell, and followed it up with copious moaning. We were all doubled over laughing at him. The other kids were even willing to hand him the victory. We ran down the hill to help him out of the wreck of our racer. That's when Regina Manzo called out, Hey, David, what are you doing? There was David Gorman bare-chested, sneakers and socks already off, removing his khaki shorts. He stood before the maw of the sewer pipe, staring into that big, dark hole. His brother yelled at him to put his pants on. The older Manzo girl, Laurel, covered her eyes and turned away. turned away. But Regina stared and smiled. David walked up to the sewer pipe, knelt into it on all fours, and robotically proceeded to crawl forward into the darkness. Come back or I'm telling mom, his brother called after him. By the time we made it to the opening of the pipe, all we caught was a flash of his white underwear before he disappeared into the black. Come back, we called. 
Come back. There's spiders in there. I like spiders. His voice came quietly, echoing to us. I'm going to call the cops, yelled Laurel. What a knucklehead, my brother said to Bill Gorman. Bill was in a panic. His parents left him in charge of David all day, were pretty unforgiving if things went wrong. Tears ran down his face. He screamed, shut up or I'll beat you. Regina Manzo said, we can catch him up at the manhole cover. She took off running up the hill to the field, followed the asphalt walkway that led toward the school's playground. We tried to catch her, but she was the fastest girl on record. When we reached the, when she reached the spot in the walkway where the road, where, where the round rusted cover was, she dropped to her knees, leaned forward to put her mouth close to the small hole cut at the rim of it and shouted. I think she called out his name. When we showed up, she turned her head and put her ear to the hole. What did he say, asked Bill. He said to leave him alone, said Regina. Bill told Laurel to get on a bike and go tell her mom to call the cops. Don't tell me what to do, said Laurel. You're not my husband. Quick, Bill cried, before somebody flushes and he's drowned. My brother took off back toward the hill to fetch his bike. Bill shoved Regina out of the way and yelled down into the pipe, What are you doing? David must have been right beneath us then. I heard his reply squeeze through the small opening in the manhole cover. His voice rang like an echo in the tin cavern. He said, figuring. Regina, me, and Laurel all laughed. Even Bill laughed for a second, and then he threatened us that we better shut up. We stood there in the autumn breeze and sharp sunlight beneath a blue sky in silence until a little while went by and the police showed up. They came in the eastern side entrance to the school fields, having traveled down the packed dirt trail that was Cowpath Road, an ancient route through the woods. They rolled over the remains of broken bottles recently shattered by Bobby Lerner and his gang. Everyone but the adults knew Bobby had a gun and a pocket full of bullets, and him and Bobby Shaw and Chocho and Mike Wolf took target practice on 40-ounce Colt 45 bottles. They'd emptied. My brother told me just that week he was surprised no one had been shot yet because, as he said, Learn is a totally crazy motherfucker. The cops came on, and I was hoping they'd flash the lights, but they didn't. As they inched across the field, good thing nobody was dying. Regina ran toward them, waving her arms over her head, her braids bouncing. When she reached them, they stopped and told her to get in the back seat, and she did. There were two cops. We all knew them. They were often at the school to give talks about not getting into cars with strange people or not smoking cigarettes. The big one with the dough face, Officer Flap, seemed stupid as the day is long, even to me at 10 years old. The other was taller, thinner, with a kind of rodent face. His upper teeth hung over his bottom lip, and he wore murky glasses. They weren't sunglasses, you know, with lenses that looked black in the sun. They were sort of, uh, hold on a second, I got a problem here. Oh, shit. I ran this off in the... Uh, hold on one second. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I got... It. I'm sorry. Light... Uh, there we go. They weren't sunglasses, you know, with lenses that look black in the sun. They were sort of light brown. You could still th see through them to where his beady weasel eyes rapidly shifted back and forth. We called him Officer Weasel because he looked like a weasel. He spoke first. As they got out of the car, Flap opened and held the door for Regina. What have we got here? His eyes were going a mile a minute behind his shitty glasses. David Gorman's in the sewer pipes, blurted Laurel Manzo. He's down there, said Weeze, pointing at the ground. He's moved on, said Regina. He was here a few minutes ago. Who knows where he is now? You got to find him, please, said Bill to the cops. Weeze told Flap, call the fire department. Aye, aye, was the response. Why is he doing this, asked Weeze. He's figuring, said Regina, and laughed. Jesus, said the cop, and shook his head. Flap, tell him to bring pork chops, he called to his partner. A few minutes later, the fire truck pulled up through the front gates of the school and over the curb with my brother following on his bike. The siren whooped twice as they approached. I thought they were going to bring lunch for, from what Officer Weeze had said, but pork chops turned out to be this stout, fat hound like a black and white beer keg on legs. The driver of the fire truck didn't get out of the curb, the, the cab, but rolled down the window and lit up a cigarette. Two other firemen climbed off the back of the truck, all done up, boots, helmets, yellow jackets. 
Flap and the Wheeze told the firemen what was going on while we listened in. Then Wheeze led the way toward Sewer Pipe Hill. Regina Manzo running out in front of them, skipping, doing cartwheels. It was afternoon by then, and the sun was warm, even though it was early October. We gathered at the big dark hole and gazed in. Without anything being said, Pork Chops walked up to the concrete face the sewer pipe was set in and pissed on it. Then he crawled up into the hole, proceeded forward at the same rate as David Gorman. Does that dog know what it's doing? asked Officer Weezer. The fireman with the big mustache shrugged. A minute later, we heard pork chops barking in the distance beneath the ground. If someone flushes, will he drown, Bill asked, tears in his eyes again. The cops and firemen cracked up. Officer Flap said, your mother should have flushed. Come that evening, they weren't laughing anymore. Me and my brother eventually went home for dinner, and when we returned to the field, there were three cop cars, two more fire trucks, and an ambulance. The local TV reporters were there, Mr. Tory was there, and most of their neighbors who lived by the school. At one point, they had a dozen men crawling through the sewer pipes, cops, firemen, special rescue workers. Mr. and Mrs. Gorman were there, too. By that hour, Bill had a black, black eye and a split lip for his trouble. Mrs. Gorman, crazy red hair, horse teeth and a jaw that didn't quit, was smoking like a machine and yelling at the chief of police, to stick his ass in a meat grinder. Gorman's old man with his watery eyes and drooping earlobes stood there peering into the hole like he was contemplating maybe taking a powder himself. All I knew about him was that he crafted tiny statues from his own earwax. I saw a yellow-brown man on horseback brandishing a saber. He kept it in a matchbox on a piece of cotton. All through that night into the morning and then through the entire next day into the night again, the search continued. I overheard one of the firemen say to Mr. Tory that the sewer system beneath the school stretched out for miles in all directions, like a labyrinth beneath the, the, the neighborhood. That was the word he used. And when he went, when I went home, I tried to look it up in the dictionary, but I couldn't figure out how to spell it. I asked my mother when she came in to kiss me goodnight, and she said, it means amaze. I thought she meant amaze, not amaze. All I saw was so many pipes going every which way for miles. It made my head spin and left me amazed. I fell asleep with that image, a bureaucracy of sewer pipes that reached down to hell and at the edges of their existence slowly propagated more of themselves. Funny thing, about a month after all this happened, a miracle occurred. Mr. Boyle, the maintenance man over at Our Lady of Persistent Faith, was down in the distant third basement of that centuries-old church and heard a whimpering noise in the dark. He spun around and trained his flashlight in its direction. It appeared to be the ghost of a dog, and Mr. Boyle said the sight of it made him jump. Boyle was also a volunteer fireman, and as he got closer to the dog, he recognized it to be pork chops. All the creature's hair had turned pure white. After he was taken to the fire station, it was discovered the dog had gone blind. He was very weak and could barely get up to go outside. He died a few days later, was buried with full honors. My father decided pork chops must have survived, quote, on a steady diet of mice and turds, unquote. But why'd all this, why'd all this fur turn white, I asked. Some crazy shit, said the old man, shrugged and went back to reading the telegraph. By then, pretty much everybody had forsaken the vigil and all hope of ever seeing the lost boy again. Only Bill religiously went to the sewer pipe hill and called into the big dark hole, always threatening, hoping for an answer. During that winter, I tried to figure why David Gorman had crawled out of our lives. My mother said to of him, that kid was never right. He was quiet, one of those people who couldn't look you in the eye, but just give you a bashful glance every now and then. He blushed deeply and chewed on the skin of his thumb knuckle. My father said he caught him one day, knocking his head, against, head repeatedly against the wall of the Gorman's house. They lived next door to us. He was really banging it, my father said. His fucking head must be like a coconut. David got into trouble back in fifth grade because he showed his dick to Regina Manzo at recess one afternoon. She kicked him right in the nuts. It turned into a big deal. Tory had Mr. and Mrs. Gorman in, and the cops showed up at school. He got beaten black and blue with a strap 
by his father and was suspended for three days. My brother had a theory he laid out for me one night when we sat on the southern slope of Suapai Hill, looking up at the stars. He smoked a cigarette he'd stolen from my mother. The sun had just set, and there was a strong, cool breeze sweeping across the school fields and through the rattling autumn leaves. So he crawls in and keeps going, said my brother, getting ready to launch into his explanation. But I stop him by asking, why? He sighed, shook his head, and then continued. So he's deep underground, and I'll bet you he hooks up with the mole men. The mole men, I said, of course. What mole men? The ones with a load in their pants, bug eyes, and a zipper in the back of their dirt skin suits? Or the dwarf ones that show up on Superman, assheads with a ring of hair like Julius Caesar? The real mole men with snouts and claws for fingers, he said. Not that fake stuff. He probably took over down there as ruling the mole kingdom, inventing hot dogs and racing cars, machine guns and sunglasses. He's got a mole queen and an army. David Gorman? Just being human makes him king, right? So what's he doing? Planning a revolt against the surface. When the day comes, he'll give the order, and the mole men and women and children and their pet dogs will spill up into the world, eat everyone's faces, turn everything you know and love into dirt. My brother's theory seemed a sign that we thought too much about the disappearance. And then all at once, the mystifying idea of the escapade seeped out of everybody's minds like old air out of a basketball in December. We went back to the reality we had before David left his conundrum in our lives. I'd pretty much forgotten it. Only when I was passing by Sewer Pipe Hill in the dark on my way home for dinner did the memory of the weird event spark a burst of adrenaline and set me running scared all the way home. Igno ignorance was bliss until the week before Christmas when Regina Manzo whispered to me at lunch, Come over today. I have to show you something. The brushing of her warm words against my earlobe made it hard to swallow. Dizzy with curiosity, I went directly to Regina's house after school. When I rang the bell, she answered and waved me in. Is it okay with your mother, I asked. Regina took my hand and led me upstairs. My parents aren't home, she said. What about Laurel? My heart started pounding from the moment she took my hand. She's at cello practice. When we reached the second floor, we didn't turn at either of the bedrooms, but headed like a beeline for the bathroom at the end of the hall. I was blushing. My breathing was jittery. She pulled me inside and shut the door behind us. My legs trembled, and I wondered if she was going to make me watch her take a piss or something. She moved in close to me as if we were going to kiss, but she was simply reaching around me to get to the light switch. She flicked it on, and the place lit up so bright I squinted. Rushing past me, she went to a vanity built into the wall and opened a small drawer. What are we doing, I asked. She put a finger to her lips and then pointed at the toilet as if it was listening. Come here, she whispered. Standing next to her, I could see scraps of paper she was holding, laying them out on the surface of the vanity. She quietly said, there were a lot more, but I threw a bunch out. I leaned down to get a better look. All of them were wrinkled and the ink was blurred as if they'd been left out in the rain. One in which the writing was still le legible read, come be with me. Another bore a strange blotch of a message. I pointed to it and Regina said, it's a heart like on Valentine's Day. I nodded. They come up in the toilet after I pee. What? I flush and in the new clean water, a message bobs up from the dark hole. I try to snatch them out before the ink is smeared so much I can't read it. I don't know what some of them are trying to say. Where are they coming from? She silently mouthed the words, David Gorman. He's in love with me, she whispered, and shook her head like an adult in resignation and weariness. After that, my recall of the incident goes dry, and when I try to force a memory, all I get is a jumble of faces and voices and the rush of seasons out of order. The only other curio I can add to this cabin is that 30 years later, in a bar in O'Hare Airport, on the night of a blizzard, when nothing was leaving the ground, I met Bill Gorman. He looked like a sadder, larger version of himself as a kid. He drank fast and hard, double Jack Daniels each go-round. When he laughed, he made the noise, but remained expressionless. I found out that Bill had become 
a much sought after makeup artist in Hollywood, which actually made a creepy kind of sense to me. I asked about his parents and his response was dead. Finally, we went through the list of stuff either of us could remember from the old neighborhood. There was a lot of, hey, remember? He told me a few things I hadn't heard, like the fact that Lerner is a, in a suicide attempt shot himself in the head, but lived to eventually become a priest, and that Regina Manzo owned her own tech company and was a millionaire. Finally, I asked him, was there ever anything more about David? He rubbed his head like a chimp to soothe the bad thoughts and said, no, the rescue guys finally decided he must have crawled into one of the hundreds of little passageways down there, got stuck and couldn't get out. They said that if you get nervous in a tight space, your body tends to inflate. Scientists say it's not possible, but these guys worked underground for decades and swore to it. David got stuck, blew up, and died. Rats ate him. Rushing water washed him away. After I finally started making a lot of money in Hollywood, Bill said, I'd go back to the neighborhood once a year, fly from California, get a limo from JFK, go to Sewer Pipe Hill, stand in front of the hole, and call for David. It was my yearly tribute to my brother. That only lasted until the development went up and I got caught standing in someone's backyard one night, yelling into the dark where a hole used to be. The cops came and I almost got arrested. Luckily, one of them was the Wheeze, and he remembered me and David. He was thin and wasted, and his skin was leathery, like he'd been preserved somehow. You ever see those Peruvian mummies? Who knows how old he was? I pictured the Wheeze's gaze still shifting, but now more slowly, like the pendulum of a grandfather clock. Bill drained his drink. After ordering another, he told me, you know, Wheeze put a paw on my shoulder, patted my back, and said, that's all gone now. It hardly exists anymore. Once you let go, it'll be like it never happened. There was so much there was much more to this story though. I could tell you that it was specific what I can't tell you what it was specifically. I just have a feeling that there was much more. Those parts that are lost to me passed their sell by date, and my memory unceremoniously tossed them like great chopped meat from the fridge. Whatever you see here is what I have left. Before I gave Bill my best and fled across the terminal, I asked him why he thought David had done it. Was he escaping or searching for something, I said. He thought for a long time and gave me a heartfelt answer, but wouldn't you know it, I've forgotten what he told me. It was one of the two options I'd offered, I think, but which? It was so frustrating trying to remember. I spent years leaning toward escape, and then switch for a decade toward a search, only to realize I just couldn't definitively remember what he'd said. A sad thought, like a sour note from Laurel Manzo's long silence cello. In another five years or so, what's left of the story will have completely decomposed, fizzed away, fallen back into a big dark hole. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, wow. Well, ah, I don't that was know. Wonderful. Published. I don't remember that story. Oh, that was in conjunctions. Oh, yeah. That's really powerful. That. That's pretty great, Jeff. That was so That's good. So, this was one of your questions, and I'm just going to jump right in, or one of the questions that we want to ask you. I can ask questions. Yeah. Oh, by the way, if you're watching now um, and you're watching it live, if you type your question in the chat on the li Google live chat, YouTube live chat, uh, we can we can ask the guests tonight. Um, so I, I've read a lot of your stories. I've heard you read them. And um, I, I know you do this like so you incorporate a lot of your personal experience into your into your work, right? Yes. Yeah. I mean, elements of my life are you know scattered throughout. Like how much of this story, let's say, like, you know, is did, did friends ever climb into a sewer? <laughs> well, you know, I th actually, uh, it's been so long. So I use some of the names of people like the principal's name was really Mr. Tory. I right. mean, you know, no one's suing me because they're all dead now. So, <laughs> uh, I mean, I had a problem with Shadow Year because I uh, with that novel. 
I the names were really close to what they actually were when I was growing up, like the people around me. And I went to my dad's funeral, like during while that book was being put together. And these old neighbors were all still around and they came up to me and say, yeah, we read your books and everything. I, as soon as I got done there, I called my editor and I said, shit, we got to change all the, all the names. <laughs> what? Did you change them all? Yeah, we changed them all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This but this story, the sewer, sewer pipe hill was like loomed large when I was a kid. You know, we were young. I mean, that's where we found our first rain-soaked Playboys, actually full beers that hadn't been opened. Like somebody, somebody was hanging out there at night, and we'd go during the day, and we'd find all this great, you know, <laughs> contraband. And uh, we had these races we built, and we would just, you know, crack them up and – my brother was a real ham bone and you know, so he always had, had the best like fatal crashes and stuff. <laughs> uh, the other stuff, a lot, there was, I mean, kids crawled in the sewer pipe all the time. I didn't cause I have claustrophobia, but yeah, this one kid really took it to a limit. We thought he wasn't coming back, but eventually he, he popped out on uh, way on the other side of the school field came out by where this sump was. And, uh, you know, like a couple hours later, it was, uh, wow. Hours? I thought he was gone. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Actually, What's did, that? did he have a flashlight? No, he just crawled in, man. He didn't take his clothes off, but he just crawled in and kept going. You know what I mean? So, he, you know, we called to him through the sewer pipe to follow his tracks as he went. Mm -hmm. Wow. You know, fun, fun in the suburbs <laughs> back in the <laughs> 60s. Ellen. I'm not sure who's asking this. Jeff, I recognize some stuff there from Shadow Year. Is it meant to be the same kids in the same place? Or yeah, there is. This does overlap with Shadow Year, actually, with this story. But I wanted to concentrate, you know, focus on this one thing. I, I find I'm doing that more as I get older. Like, there's things that I just threw away in those books. Like, I just did them, and you know, as part of the book. But I wanted to go back and, and re-envision them. Uh, and, you know... Um, I'm doing a lot of stories uh, lately about that involve uh, things from my life. I, and also a lot of stories about aging, you know, about getting older. And I got it. And my, my publisher said the other day, he said, I think we got enough stories to do a whole book about Lynn, about Lynn <laughs> stories, you know, at this point, I really want to do that. But he said, yeah, definitely. we got to wait a couple of years, but you know, uh -huh. after this book. Yeah. Karen, um, what what aspect of Athena, the real Athena, I mean, inspired you to create this kind of evil-ish? <laughs> um, yeah, well, that's right. it's that contrast between the motherly and the caring and the warlike and uh, whether or not her war is about protecting her own self or about uh, protecting a world that, of, of believers, um, that sort of thing. But I saw this amazing statue. Actually, Lancelot, I went to visit him in Brooklyn last time I was in the States, which is a couple of years ago now, um, and he took me to Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn. I don't know if anyone else has been there. Just yeah. amazing, just most wonderful. One. I mean, obviously, we all love cemeteries, but this one was particularly amazing. And he took me there deliberately because there's this incredibly tall, Tall, uh, powerful statue of Athena where she's holding her shield, but the face is this sort of caring, beautiful face. Mm -hmm. And and I guess she's made of stone as well. So it was all that sort of elements of her that I, I just really liked. And then bringing, yeah, bringing in um, Pallas, the, the asteroid, was just a really interesting element of it. And then having to think about metals and uh, it all just coalesced, I guess. Yeah, mm -hmm. That story is creepy too, man. Yeah, oh, good. it's got some creepies in it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, that's and the that whole cult thing, like, you know, I quite enjoyed sort of tapping into that, um, trying to understand cults and how they happen and how believers get drawn in. And it all really is that slow progression of you start as an outsider and you're gradually drawn into the centre of it until you don't really realise that what they're asking you to do is something right. way beyond what anybody should be asked to do. So I enjoyed being able to explore that that element of it. Mm. Mm. So you said this before we went live, Karen, that um, the grief hall is under development. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so a guy here in Australia called Josh Kosky has got uh, some uh, development money from our uh, Screen Canberra. 
uh, to develop it into a feature film and then hopefully a, a series as well. So at this stage, it's just for just the script stage and the treatment stage. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we're having lots of discussions about who right. stays and who goes and who the next monsters might be and how, mm. to, how to depict it. It's really interesting. I mean, it's a very, um, uh, I don't know, it's going, to be, it's going to be interesting how to capture the ghost, but how much fun is it going to be to be able to capture the ghosts that haunt all of us? Right. So and how in, in, a, in a book I can't necessarily describe the ghosts that might be around all of us, but in a film we can actually see them without really yeah. making too much of them. That's so a I think it's going to be really creepy. Too. Yeah. That book is incredibly mind blowing. Oh, thank you, Jeff. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. Karen, Karen, lots of great music. Like it's going to be fun playing with the music and all that sort of thing. I don't know who yeah. we're going to actually get to write the music, but that part because that's a really important part of it. So, well, yeah, know, it's very exciting. I know very somebody who does uh, compositions for TV, film, and commercials. Oh, you, there you go. Oh, well, yeah. let me know later on, and we'll. Buddy, I, I can recommend. But. That'd be uh, good. Yeah, so so Jeff, uh, it's a question you wanted us to ask. <laughs> Don't even bother. <laughs> Don't even talk about it. No, what else is in the book? What other stories are in your uh, book? All right, first tell us about the collection. All right, yeah, it's come it's coming out in July. I told them I wanted uh, I wanted to make sure that people knew that since you know it's supposed to come out this month. So uh the collection is um I forget how many stories are in it, but there's three new stories in it. I was going to read one tonight, but Ellen reminded me, if you read the story, it means it's published. So I can't do that to my publisher. I rarely read the same story, you know, more than once. I think I've read this one like three times now, but I wanted to give an example of what the book is like. It's got stories like this. There's another one that I did for Ellen in there called Hibbler's Minions, which is about an evil flea circus. Um <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and a, a couple other ones. One is about, again, like gods and goddesses. One is about uh, Sisyphus, uh, mm -hmm. the myth of Sisyphus. And um, a place out in, out on, um, in South Jersey by the Delaware, out in like the marsh land there, there was a, there's a bar. There was a bar called The Thousand Eyes. And there's a guy who sings there called Ronnie Dunn, the voice of death. He's a oh, singer. Oh, wow. Uh, and there, there's those kind of stories. And then there's a lot of stories that are autobiographical. I have a story in there that's dedicated to Kit Reed. Uh, a story, a couple of stories with Lynn in, the, Lynn them in there. You know, and uh, yeah. I love your Lynn stories. What? I love your Lynn stories. There's a bunch of them now. Mm -hmm. So how many stories are in the book? I don't know. Hold on a second. Ask Karen a question. I'll tell you. I got to. I had to. I had him up. Karen, I what think there's like seventeen or sixteen. 17. And how many are original and how many are are, uh, re, are like? Uh, there's three new ones, mm -hmm. and then the rest are ones that have been published before. Okay. okay, Karen, what are you working on now aside from the screenplay? Ah, uh, something. Something I hope is for you, Ellen. I'm looking at a. a I don't know. I'm a, a novella. I'm working on a novella um, inspired by how much junk is in this world and what we might do with it. Because, okay. um, you know, I work two days a week in a second-hand shop and everything in our shop is stuff that's been taken to the rubbish dump or the tip, we call it, um, that people have thrown away and it gets sorted through and it gets brought into my shop. And we get just incredible stuff in there. We get <laughs> Royal Albert tea sets that are worth $500 and we shop. get... With you again. I've got a, we get diaries. I've got this incredible diary of a Polish woman who came to Australia in the 19, I think 1952 or something like that, and she kept a diary for 30 years, wow. um, mostly in Polish but in part in English, um, which is just incredible. And it ended up at my shop, which is kind of sad, and it's got little letters from her son in there and, I don't know, there's all sorts of, there's a murder and all sorts of stuff in this diary for real. Wow. So, mm -hmm. yeah, hey, so, what about that? Wasn't there some haunted thing you had from there? Oh. There was some haunted thing, wasn't there? Oh, there's always a haunted something. What was that? There's, <laughs> there's always haunted things. I found, I found like little, uh, a little pencil, a little um, matchbox of teeth one time. That was interesting. Yeah, so uh, uh, inspired by a place where all this stuff comes in and it sort of goes out the other side, sorted, and uh, so something like that. Lots of hauntings and lots of ghosts, and so I'm having fun with that. 
Yeah, someone said they special. Is there really a story called Lynn versus Monster Eight, or is that a joke? <laughs> That's a joke, right? Jesse Bullington made. I mean, there isn't really a story called that, is there? What's that? Is there a story called Lynn versus Monster Eight, or is no, no? He, she's in that story, Monster Eight. Oh, there kicks a some ass in it. Oh, monster Eight. Okay. He kicks some also, monster ass in it. Also, and then Jewel Wren, but also the Bedroom Light, which is one of my favorites. Yeah. Yeah. So anyone more questions? Yeah, please ask some questions if you if you want. Are you two want to ask a question of the other? Tell me about the earwax, Jeff. That was disgusting. Yeah. <laughs> oh. no, that, hey, listen, that's true. Oh, that guy no. made, he was a car mechanic and he made oh, um oh, he made oh, this was in Shadow Year too, I think. One of the little piece uh, tidbits. But yeah, he used to make Sculptures out of his oh earwax. God, so he had he had a shitload of earwax. This guy. I mean, <laughs> he really had a load of earwax, and he kept kept them in little matchboxes oh, on cotton. God. I thought they were fascinating when I was a oh. kid. He worked on foreign cars. He was really quiet, dude. Like his oh. eyes were only watery, and he had these big ears. You know, and his his wife was just like a bitch on wheels, man. <laughs> well, you know, you married to a man who makes little sculptures out of his earwax. I'd yeah. be pretty bitchy too, I reckon. I guess so. I would be unhappy with my life <laughs> if I was married to a man who did that. And even who had that much earwax. Well, makes like you think out of his ears. Um, yeah. Dion asked, or wait, Ellen asked if we they can hear things later. Yes, you can listen yeah, to Yeah, this is all going to be archived on YouTube. So the same exact link you're watching now, you can watch it anytime. <laughs> I love to I love the stuff about the go karts, Jeff, and that's like that is absolutely an Australian thing too. We used to build yeah. go karts, and I lived on a hill. I had quite a steep hill where I lived, and my driveway was the one that it was the last pull in before you went down this really steep hill and basically died at the end of it. So our driveway was the one that everyone would pull into. The, um, the, the, the wheels you really even... wanted were the ones on the shopping carts. Right. We tried to like steal shopping carts from the you know the local grocery store yeah. and take the wheels off them. <laughs> we never had anything like that when I was growing up, go karts. But on the other hand, we had in our grassy hill in Yonkers, we sledded down them. That was one for sleds. Oh, that's oh, great. Okay, yeah. But we yeah. never had any go karts or anything like that either in the Bronx or Yonkers when I was growing up. Did you have what about you, Matt? Did you have go karts? No, nah, we we did a lot more stupider things like make our own fireworks and oh uh, yeah a lot of shit. We, we definitely had like spots in the woods i remember it kind of reminded me of jeff's story where do you know what a blockbuster is it's like, yeah it's like one of those things that's packed full of it's a it's basically like i think it was like they always used to say it was a quarter stick of dynamite i don't know if it actually, yeah but that's what we call that's what said. m80s <laughs> no, an M80 was a third of a block. A blockbuster was basically three M80s. So yeah. we yeah. dropped it in a in a sewer in the woods. It was like a what sewer. What are we doing in the woods? Stupid <laughs> shit. Like what kids do. Yeah, but why was there a sewer in the woods? Oh, why was there a sewer? I don't know. It, I, I think it just cut through because it was like it was it was um a lake between like it was a lake in the middle of the town, like a woods. And there was a sewer there. It was like a manhole, basically. And, the, and he dropped it in. And these things had waterproof fuses. But I think the sewer was empty or something. So it blew up in the sewer. And we heard the echo, like, from, like, miles away. Like, it was just, <laughs> I don't know how far away it was. It was like, like, we almost didn't hear it by us. But then, but then like, far away, you hear. <laughs> that was loud. We, I could tell you a lot more stupid shit, but probably not on YouTube. <laughs> Karen, what's your new book about? Uh, so well, look, the, the two latest books I've done, we've got, um, we've reprinted Slights. Like, so Jerry, who did Tool Tales, is bringing out the new edition of Slights. Yeah. Have you read, I don't know if you read that one. That came out I saw that. I, yeah, I know the book. I haven't read it yet. Yeah, so it's, it's come out with a new fantastic cover and... Um, I saw so the cover. It looks good, yeah. Yes. No, I yes. mean, but what about the one the one that Matt mentioned? Oil into Bones. Oh, Into that Bones one. Like Oil. So that's a yeah. novella. That's been out for a little while, not too long. Oh, um, oh okay. That's set, I think you'd like that one, Jeff. That's set in a rooming house. 
uh, where basically lost people. I'll, I'll sort of explore. There we go. Um, I was exploring the idea of a rooming house as being kind of the last place that people go before, while they still think that their life is going to be okay. They maybe <laughs> have a part-time job and they've got a bed to sleep in and that kind of thing. So it's the last place where they have a place that might possibly be their own. Uh, and a woman who goes there and she discovers that um, every, when they go to sleep, the manager of this place uh, records their voices because ghosts talk through them. So Whoa. you go to sleep and the ghosts go and tell their stories. That sounds great. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds really good. Yeah, it's pretty, it's another pretty, I don't know, there's lots about the routine of these sort of places and trying to cling on to a routine uh, even when everything else is falling apart. So they make Now, did you do research on boarding houses? I did a little bit, but this one, it's actually been something that's been in my mind for probably about 25 years or so. Yeah. I stayed in one in Melbourne, um, my husband and I, just when we went down for someone's wedding and we stayed in this boarding house in Melbourne. And it just obviously had a really strong effect on me, I think, just because of the characters were there. And, you know, there was one young woman who obviously was living there as well. And she'd try to make friends from everybody who walked in the door and just all of the characters. And so I feel like I've actually been... Uh, collecting people to live in this boarding house for 25 years like you do with your man with the earwax and the watery eyes <laughs> i just <laughs> i've just kind of gathered people who somehow were going to belong there and then finally when it came time to write the story i knew who was going to be there that's so, cool yeah 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 it's um it was, it was fun to actually get the chance to finally to finally write it and finally have the right story about it i was also inspired there's quite a number of people with uh, uh, crimes of young girls and young children in particular, where they say they were last seen near a boarding house and never seen again. Oh, and of wow. course, there's a, yeah, so there's lots of lots of examples of crimes that happen in these places, and people are often anonymous and just. But I also wanted to have that feeling of it's the last. It's there is a sense of community in these places as well, um, and how humans build community regardless of where we are, um, regardless yeah. of our circumstances. We'll try to form relationships and friendships of the people and around us. And I love that about people. I love that about humans. I mean, we don't have boarding houses per se and we do. It's like a single occupancy hotel, no? No, they got, uh, they still have boarding houses. Where? Uh, well, I know Derek was looking at one in Oregon for a while, but he didn't go there. He got an apartment instead. <laughs> but it was pretty high class, actually. But it was a shared bathroom, that kind of stuff, you know what I mean? yeah. So, yeah. yeah, a big house with lots of bedrooms, um, maybe a big shared shared kitchen, that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. so it's a, a place that I don't necessarily want to live, but I also just, yeah, it's such an interesting place to explore. Mm -hmm. Huh, it's funny, I haven't yeah. heard of those. That idea of family is something I'm always interested in writing too. Like the girl in the glass, they're all like grifters. But they all make up like a family, you know what I mean? Yeah. They operate yes. like a family. For some yeah. reason, that's always kind of not conscious to me, but on in the back of the stuff, some of the things I write, you know, community, yes. family kind of thing. Yeah, but I love that. I love that about your stuff, um, that you've got that sense of, that sense running through it as well. Well, um, it's always, you know, people think that, you know, you want to have the pyrotechnics of people fighting all the time and shit, but... There's something really interesting about when people do good for each other and get along. That's really kind of even almost more interesting, you know, yes. uh, in, in a way. And it, sometimes it's just those small things that you do for each other, those small yeah. moments of helping each other or just, yeah. And why 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 we're driven to do that. Like it's, I guess it's part of survival is that we need to actually work together. Like humanity doesn't survive unless we have some kind of, uh, working together system right. going, yeah. But I love yeah. it. I mean, I love that. Even a little shared glance on the on a on the bus or something with somebody, you know. Right. When the bus nearly runs through a red light and you all nearly die, and you kind of go <laughs> and you look at each other, and yeah. You know, <laughs> I know when I used to go to New York when I worked in New York, right? And I lived out on the end of the island. Uh, I used to I got to know people just from taking the trains yes. and, and yes. seeing the same people every day, even people on the street. In New York, I got to know just by being in the ne certain neighborhood or something. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's kind of interesting how quick that stuff builds up. You know, well, yeah. It What's weird is when you deal with a tradesperson all the time and you see them, you know, every day, every few days, see them out of context. Yeah. 
into someone in the subway downstairs and I had no, I, I was like, where do I know you from? Right. Turns out he was, we worked in the deli or something. Yeah. You know, like, oh, cause out of context, it's like, you know, yes, you know them, you're friendly with them, but in, in a very particular in their face in a different place. So I know you, but where do I know yeah. you? I know yeah. you. <laughs> so you guys are like probably some of the most prolific writers I know. How many stories have you had? Do you, do you know, do you keep a track? Um, I have got a track. I think I've I've written nearly three hundred. Wow, Jesus. I think. Or so. I, I'm only up to like hundred and fifty, and maybe a few more than that. <laughs> I've written, yeah, three hundred. Yeah, something like that. But none of them, you know, a lot of them aren't very good. A lot of them I wrote when I was really young and whatever. But I do have them all written down. And then you have these um, ten microfictions. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. right. They all count. That counts as ten. I, I was talking to. Uh, I think it was Silverberg, you know, Robert Silverberg at one of the conventions. And I, I don't know, I was talking with a bunch of people and he was there and I said, I, I had published almost a hundred stories. Right. He said, by the time I was 21, I published a hundred stories. Wow. He's published like five, 600 stories. I, think I don't know, man. Enough. I believe him, but I, I, I don't have any way to tell if that's true or not. I'm sure well, it it, they'll probably, some he gave away for free and you know, who knows? But it doesn't sound unlikely. Yeah, he, yeah. He would write a novel a week, you know, and some of these people would do that in the 50s and 60s to support themselves. Yeah. And they were short novels, though. They may have been 30, 40,000 words, you know, right. novellas and not full novels. So do, do you guys, like, when you're working on longer stuff, do you just say, oh, you know, I'm going to shoot off a short story this week and then go back to this longer thing? Or are you just like, I'm going to finish this, this novel and then I'm going to write short stories and then another novel? Like, do you? segmented or do you you switch back well how does it work with you guys i usually sell the novel then i wrote a write a novella for ellen <laughs> <laughs> and then i do a couple of stories and in the last three months i write the novel <laughs> <laughs> I'm, always, I'm, I'm always working on two or three things at once so a novel i've got a novel going and i've got novella going and a couple of short stories i just depends on what sort of pushing my Pushing my buttons on the day, I guess. Yes. Um, yeah. I certainly don't. I, I, there's no such thing as pushing out a short story for me. Though they take me at least three to four months usually to write. Mm -hmm. Just yeah. the the thinking process and funny. getting the ideas and researching and just it takes a really long time to percolate and get to the end. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah. I'm not so, quick. Someone has another question, Jesse Bullington. Uh, the story, which is the obvious. Which is obviously the horror of your story, Karen. Gary rejecting a real human connection with Gemma for the promise of divine. Yeah, I that's interesting. I, that's yeah. I, I think that is definitely a part of it. The horror, yeah, the horror to me was the sense of loneliness in him, and yet here is this relationship, obviously that they could have worked in. But he, I mean, he's obviously not a very nice person. He's not used to having people around him. He's not used to actually having good relationships. Like the opposite of what we've been talking about, Jeff, is that sense of family. He has no sense of family. Um, but yeah, that, I'm really glad you picked up on, on, on that, Jesse. It's definitely an element that I wanted to capture. Mm -hmm. um, a sacrifice that he made without maybe even realising he was making the sacrifice and found it very easy in the end because he was so sucked into the cult of Athena. Why was it Athena who he was obsessed with? I mean, it really I, Athena in particular. Athena and what she was giving them, like that, you know, I don't, I'm actually very lucky that I don't have chronic pain, but I know people who do and I know what they live with. Like it's a really hard thing to live with. Yeah. And so what you would do to, in order to be free from that pain, I think you would make a lot of sacrifices for that. Yeah. But yes. And also her, like they know, you know, we don't, we don't know what she's going to, we don't even know what side she's on, Athena. We don't really know what she's going to do with her mindlessly marching soldiers but right. probably not going to be good sorry to say <laughs> <laughs> yeah the whole the whole uh thing of who needs who more i like that part you know yeah that was good that kind of ambiguity i like that yeah. yes yeah well it's, i mean the god things are fantastic i wrote a novella years ago um for uh goddess goddess ishtar and I was just so fascinated by her and the way, you know, they, they, they're so huge and actually completely fill people's lives and then they fade away and we don't we, we know about them as mythology now. And I think that's absolutely fascinating as well. It's even the same with any kind of fame. Like uh, 
people who say such and such needs no introduction in 1952 and then now nobody's even heard of this person. <laughs> you know, and I love that. Like I love picking up old movie magazines and things and you read about people who you've, you have no idea who they are now but they were front page and everybody knew who they are. So you that, that's do a lot of research before you write your stories? Oh, Me? yeah. Oh, I'll, I'll, Karen? I'll, either one of you, yeah. Oh, go ahead. You go first, you. No, I'll go ahead. I, I didn't hear what he said. I didn't. I said you tend to do a lot of research before your stories. I was addressing Karen, but but I mean Jeff, you could absolutely uh, answer that too. Go ahead, Karen. I'll go after you. Oh, it depends on what I'm depends on what I'm working on. I'm definitely for that one, I did a lot of research into the mythology and then looked up the metals and actually got a big picture of uh, the metal Palladium and how beautiful it was and let that inspire me. So, yeah, it depends on, on where I'm going with something. With this novella I'm writing about uh, reusing objects, I was actually got, went into the old uh, newspapers um, just to find out about uh, burnt buildings and that. So trying to find some old burnt buildings and things. So I tend to use just little imagery to inspire things. Oh, in fact, you know what I did do? I haven't got it right here. I've got, I've, I've got a book of true crime photographs. Mm. And there's this amazing photo of a nanny who was actually a nurse who had killed a newborn baby. And right. she has this terribly yeah. tragic backstory. And, but just this photo that was captured of her looking sort of stony face, but the eyes are just so filled with sorrow. It was just the most incredible thing. So she, that inspiration is going to be my main adult character in this story. Mm. Um, and everything yeah so that sort of research i'll look at pictures and things to try and build my own imagery and my own sense of the story i guess and my own secret ways so trying to find that little secret doorway into the story i guess is what i'm doing when i'm doing research yeah so if you like if you're if you're writing the story and then you hit a point where it's like something that you don't know and it, you need it for the story let's say do you just like stop writing and go research it or you just like I'll make shit up and then come back to it later. Oh, I never know where the story's going. I just start writing and yeah. then follow it. I mean, I don't really know where they're going to wind up. You know? That's, yeah. No, I'm about that way too. But I'll, if I need an excuse to stop writing, I'll go and do that research, man. I'll stop and go, <laughs> oh, I need to find out what, you know, what they might have eaten on the such and such ship in 1872 or whatever. Um, I'll do that. But if I'm really in a, in a flow, I'll just do a little dot point and, and move on beyond it. See, Jeff, when you said you don't know where your story's going, that amazes me because I feel like your stories end like like on a perfect note, you know? Yeah, not always. I, I sometimes they do. You luck out, you know? You get lucky. But, uh, <clears throat> you know, it's the whole idea of like I, uh, I you know, this is – I, you know, I was talking about this not too long ago, but I, I, I learned this from Gardner, from John Gardner. He's like, yeah, yeah. find the character, see the character, because he believed character was story. Mm -hmm, find yeah. the character in your mind's eye, follow the character, and the character will take you to the story. And then just if your writing is good enough, record what you see here, feel, taste, and touch in the situation. You know what I mean? Yeah. And yeah. you'll get a story out of it. So the thing is, is like where most people think writing a story, you have to exert more control. In reality, you need to exert less control. Take your hands off the wheel and let the story take you, you know? And what happens is all that stuff that people think they need to think about to put in the story, you know, symbolism, light motifs, all that crap, it's automatically there at the end if you're true to the character. It'll just be in there. I mean, you may have to tweak it at the end. You know what yeah. I mean? Tweak it. And then you got to get Ellen to go over it. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> and and it, that, the stories much, come out that way. What? How much of that is like maybe you have a natural instinct towards that? Like like if, if, if like another writer, let's say, would follow that same advice, would they – would it work? Like you're, you, you teach writing. So no, do you, I teach people how to do this. I mean, they and, do and it and it comes out good. Yeah, a lot of them. It I mean, it's not going to work for everybody. But I mean, I'll give you one one re one instance where my my thinking is different. People are talking all the time about world building. Yeah. And my response to that is, what am I a fucking you know carpenter or something? A, <laughs> a bricklayer? I mean, when I when I could be a magician and just 
create a pa ice palace over here. I don't have to fucking build it. I just imagine it. It's almost like even it's almost like I'm accessing it, like it already exists, mm. and I'm accessing these things. You know? Yeah. That's when yeah, it's going I'll, good. When it's <laughs> not. Well, Karen, you, know. did you come up with the character first or the setting? Actually, um, David was asking a question it, that kind uh, of related. Yeah, David Rivera has a question. Um, let's go with Karen with this, and then Jeff, maybe you could circle back. David asks, uh, love the settings in tonight's stories. Jeff and Karen, when writing your 450 stories, does the setting usually come to you before or after you've thought of other, other elements in the story? Oh, every story is, is totally different, really. With that one, um, I would say setting was first. Um, the first, yeah, I, I travelled from Chicago to Grand Rapids um, when I was there in the States, that was a couple of years ago, and just loved that so much. On the bus, I mean, sorry. And I just, oh, my gosh, I love that bus trip. It was so fascinating and so interesting. I was just gazing out the window and absorbing things. Um, and at one stage I saw a massive, um, the Palladium that I talked about, the big, the big churchy centre was this kind of creepy big concrete building in the middle of nowhere. And that is definitely where the story started from and the idea for the cultish nature of it. So it really depends. Sometimes the setting will be so inspirational that I've just got to write a story about it. Sometimes a character voice will come into my head. Sometimes an image will be the thing that I start with and I've got to figure out how to uh, get that onto the page and how to turn it into a story. So, yeah, it really, it really does depend. But with the story I, have to, I, read, uh, I have to get the voice first. Once I have the voice, I know the story. You know, the voice comes to me, how it's going to be told. I mean, once that that's going, I'm good to go, you know, and then I'm, I can go. But um, uh, I need to I need to know that. And even though I write a lot of autobiographical stuff and it's from my voice, every time it's a little different. I have to catch what it is about it, you know, so. And that's does that just come thing. to you? Like, how do you, I mean, I'm the same. You definitely, and that's what I say. Anyone, anytime I teach writing or talk to newer writers, you've got to find that voice, and it's got to be your voice, yeah, and an individual voice. But I don't know what the magic is to find it. Like, sometimes it does just pop into your head, doesn't it? Like, you actually hear that first line, or you hear a line of dialogue, and that's when. Like, I found the nurse. I found that nurse in the book of the photos, and once I saw her, then I had her voice, and then I knew what the story was going to be. Well, you know what the thing is? A lot of students now, a lot of young writers, they don't want to bother with grammar. But when you learn how to manipulate sentence structures, you can capture your own authorial voice. You know, the, the music of a voice like long sentences, short sentences like that, or even for a character's voice. But, but being able to do that allows you to manipulate the structures so that you can catch what it is you want to capture, you know? And, uh, I don't know. I really, when I started to really pay attention to grammar, not that I'm the best at it, but you know, Ellen will tell you that, but uh, you know, I, I, it, it allowed me to, it allowed me to capture the music of a voice. If you sit at a party and listen to people speak back and forth without being conscious of it, they're being conscious. You'll hear it, it flows up and down short sentences, long sentences, and it's music almost. Sometimes it's cacophonous. Sometimes it's, mellifluous and you know uh you could capture that you capture uh you know something about the story in that and does that make any sense i don't know <laughs> yeah <laughs> so, uh, come across a story a manuscript then i realize the sentences have the same structure like five in a row that's yeah intentional and then it boy does it like what have you done you know? mm. <laughs> no 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 i i mean you know i'm pretty sure it's not intentional I mean, if it's intentional, you can tell. I mean, and it's part of the voice and it's the cadences and that's the way it should be. But when it's an error, when it's a, a subconscious accident that someone is doing this and it's that it's not grammar, it's just incorrect. It's just bad sentence structure, I guess. Well, it, what it usually is is a subject followed directly by the verb. It screws up the flow or there is no flow. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, so um, uh, many, I don't know how much, some writers are very, I mean, it seems to me from all the stories I've read over the years, some people are much more conscious of the flow of their story, the language and the cadence and the movement and everything. And other people don't seem to care about that. And it doesn't mean it's necessarily less effective. 
Um, I mean, it's a, usually a different kind of story, but it's interesting me, to me that which writers care seem to care about it and mm -hmm. others who don't. Well, I'm, I'm one of those many, many writers who do a read aloud before I send out the story for the first time or the last time or whatever. I'll read it aloud to hear those cadences and right. you know, try and make sure the rhythm's right and that mm -hmm. all of those sort of elements of it. Well, I'll I, read things aloud when I'm when I'm having trouble with a sentence in a manuscript that I'm reading. I'll read it aloud, and it's like, damn thing. I tell the author, read that aloud. That's wrong. Something's mm. wrong. This does not sound right. You know. Um, and also, when, when you're trying to figure out where the commas should go in a very long sentence, you know, or if they should be there, you know, so I'll read something aloud. If it's a very long sentence, you know, sometimes I figure out, okay, where is, is there enough of a pause in this or do they need something else, a semicolon or a dash, you know. Um, reading sentence for writers and editors, I think reading the sentences aloud is really, really helpful. Mm -hmm. Especially in dialogue. I mean, I hate dialogue yes. it's stilted so much. There's so much bad dialogue where it's stilted because, and that's not how people talk, you know? Yeah. Um, Elmore Leonard is one of the greatest people who writes dialogue. You know, it's like bum, 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 bum. And you don't, he, you don't have to do the he said, she said when you have enough vo different voices speaking, you can usually yeah. tell. So that's kind of interesting that, uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. I didn't mean to start that dead. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions, people? Or do you want to, anything you want to say? Questions from the peanut gallery? <laughs> Everybody went home. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, like, you know, I say this every, every month to every reader, but you guys seriously are some of my favorite writers. Like, I'm, not, I'm not just blowing smoke. I mean, I never blow smoke, but you guys are really good and Thank i appreciate you. hearing your your stories and your your writing advice because you know uh it just question. yeah oh, man, i remember the, first, the story here. i wrote for you was at the cities for your cities anthology that you put together yes the paper and I, yeah, yeah i still love, really love my story that i wrote for you it's one of my you know you say what's your favorite story and that one i wrote for you is really one of my favorites and it was so cool to have the freedom to write that sort of story but the oh, city underground mine was it and yeah. what people will do for um if they want to have children they can't have children and what people are willing to do to mm -hmm. do that but, mm -hmm. yeah it was a real it was a great anthology that one it was a world fantasy award winner oh there yeah, you, go. Matt, you never asked me for that one <laughs> i don't think i knew that well, actually no i wasn't the editor of that i, I was oh yeah yeah okay <laughs> oh that's right yes i'm yeah. sorry sorry to get you in trouble Matt. that's all right i'm just kidding. <laughs> all right uh, we have a question here from J.S. Uh, Brucolar. Uh, Jeff, you said you can access setting voice character when things go well. Can you talk about an instance in a recent story when things didn't go well? Karen, too. How did you overcome it? Well, I got a story that's due about four weeks ago for a editor, not not Ellen, that I'm just completely stuck on. And this says I've never not handed in a story when I told somebody I would. But this one has me stumped, man. I'm working on it every day. I've been working on this fucking story for like months. I just can't get it. It just seems like start to scratch. Can you what? just do, can you just do a different one and leave that one? I'll I keep it. trying that. I do I try that too. I mean I'm just like stuck on it. So you know I'm still working on it. Hopefully I'll get something done before the absolute last death nail at, of the you know they close <laughs> it up but this is the first time that's ever happened but you know what can you do <laughs> well that's what she wants to know what are you going to do <laughs> what am i going to do keep trying yeah. to write it until like they tell yeah. me like jeff go but are you home trying from different it. angles are you like looking at different character point of views or like how are you when, when you say you try and write it every day what I'm are you doing the bourbon i drink the bourbon and look at it <laughs> 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 How far have you gotten in it, and where do you think the problem? Oh, is? I mean, I, I've I've done like I've done six or seven beginnings that I've gotten pretty far into, but I, what comes to me is like, you know <laughs> what, man, this I'm looking at some shit here, uh, and I, you know, <laughs> I know when it's shitty, and I just, uh, you know, I just can't do it. I'd rather not do it, you know. So I'll keep I'll keep gonna keep trying. We'll see. 
Keep, we if you keep trying, you, Jake. that helps. What? We, we believe in you. Yeah, you know, do you believe in fairies? Yeah, I mean, you know, I just keep, I just keep hacking away at it. That's the, that's all I could do. Karen, mm. what, what are you doing? The story? Uh, well, so the ones that I find the hardest are the ones that where you're asked to write for an anthology that's very narrow in what they want from you, and trying to figure out how to write that in a way that it, everybody else isn't going to write. Yeah. So they're the ones that I sometimes find myself blocked um, because you've got to try and figure you've got to kind of think 15 steps ahead of or, or differently different different 15 different angles away from what other people will think about um, so yeah those ones are just about as Jess says writing it in 15 different ways I suppose and doing research and and maybe reading other things reading weird magazines or um, no yeah that, I don't know what my solution for that is. The most recent one actually was um, one where it was basically a revenge anthology um, where I didn't want it just to be the victim rising up and taking revenge. I wanted something else to be occurring. And then I saw in an old Punch magazine there was an ad, I think it was for cigars or something, but it was set at the Steering Wheel Club, which was a real club in London in the 1960s where they actually had steering wheels from racing drivers up on their walls. And I was so fascinated by that about what, you know, and of course in my story the steering wheels are from accidents where people have died, obviously. <laughs> obviously. Um so I but I just needed that little that little slight shift of thinking. So that was yeah, that was flicking through an old magazine that gave me that little secret way, secret finding the secret door in there. Um, changing point of view from a character, like if I'm stuck on something, I'll write it from someone else's point of view, even if it's not going to be my end character. Right from an observer's point of view, from someone who's watching from seven stories up and looking down at what's happening below. Um, those are some of the tricks I'll use to try and break my way into a story that's tricky. Yeah. Well, you, just just describing too, like just describing something in very great detail is sometimes my way into a story, even if that description isn't going to end up in the story, but really specific and detailed description of something, some item in the story can sometimes help me break through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, usually if I get the first paragraph, I'll take the rest of the day off. I know I got something, you know, and then I'll come back. And like Hemingway says, you know, not that I use a lot of his techniques, but he says, uh, you know, start the story where it starts or halfway through it. Then always know what's going to happen next when you lay off for the day. That way <laughs> you have a way to begin the next day. You know what I mean? Those are two yeah. good pieces of advice, I think. Yeah. Mm. When you but how do you stop though? Like how if you if you're on a flow, oh. how do you make yourself stop to say you've got something to start at the next day? Because sometimes it it takes a lot of effort to get to that point, you know? Yeah. Uh like starts and stops and starts and stuff. And then but when I get it, uh, you know, I'm like, all right, good, that's a day's work right there. And then come back and once I have the idea, the story goes fast. I could write yeah. a story really fast. But I have to get the right idea first. I have to get the right feeling, you know, yeah. the mood, the voice, and so forth. And that's just me sitting here staring at the wall. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I try all that shit, you know, where they tell you, like, you know, writer's block, where they talk about, like, people have told me so many crazy things, like sit in a dark room and try to hypnotize yourself and shit. <laughs> you know the movie Pumpkinhead? Yeah, here's yeah. what it's about when you get into that head. The evil must run its course. You know, yeah. no matter what you do, the best thing to do is go out and do something nice for somebody. You know what I mean? Join the world and, like, get your yeah. head out of your ass for a couple yeah. of days. Yeah. Or yeah. A couple that's of great days. advice. That usually helps somewhat. Oh, yeah, that's great advice. Stop Ellen, feeling you sorry to... for yourself. What? Oh, it's, it's, a, it's a tangent off what Karen was saying about theme anthologies and that because because so many because really good writers have a really strong voice and bring different voices to and to each story they write that if you pick a theme if you uh, you shouldn't be that afraid of writing about the same thing general thing that another writer is going to write and i wanted to use an example when i did my poe anthology i usually i don't ask for people to tell me what they're writing about but because of Poe, I wanted to know, I wanted enough variety, I wanted enough writers to write about different aspects of Poe. 
of stories and poems and nonfiction. So I asked him what they were writing. And I had at least three people writing, I think, House of Usher stories, type, but they were completely different. And I knew yeah. that because of the different voices, you know. Mm. Uh, I think David Prill one wrote, I forget, I, but I ended up, it may not have been House of Usher, but one of the stories, it was like three people wrote in the same uh, germ, the same Poe story, but there, I knew the stories would be completely different because of the voices and it didn't matter. Mm. You know, so I think with good writers, they can, you can do that. You don't have to worry too much. Yeah. I mean, my point of view. Oh, yeah, but that's, I mean, Poe was a bit broader too. Like, he, yes, you had to pick a particular story to be, or, or thing of his to be inspired by, but there was a lot of leeway within that though. Like, I wouldn't have considered that a very uh, restrictive um, anthology I, thing. I know, I mean, some of them are really restrictive, but they want to set in this period of time and this has to happen. And like, some of them can be very, I'm, very. I mean, I'm in the midst of reading for the year's best still, <laughs> last year's, and I'm reading a few anthologies that you would think that they were really broad themes and yet every story is the same. Yes. And it's like, I'm sorry, bad editing. You should not have done this. You know, it's like, there's no excuse. No. You know? Especially on a theme that's not that narrow. It's like, why did you yes. expect all these stories that are the same? <laughs> you know? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So yeah. Um, sorry. That was, a, I mean, that was a tangent, but you know, I wanted to go. No, no, interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Um, Carol asks a question, uh, how many of your stories have a flavor of horror to them? Um, I'm, I think so, quite, right? I, I assume that's directed to both authors. However, whatever ones Ellen asked for. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what I love about you, right? Both of you, you write, you, well, Jeff doesn't write real science fiction, but you both write fantasy, dark fantasy and horror. Mm. And, Karen's written a couple of science fiction stories, I think. But yeah, but even the science fiction definitely has elements of horror about it. Yeah. Like I'm not, yeah. Just because it's, I don't mm. know why. My mother thinks, my, I don't know why. I don't know why. It's what just, I just find it interesting. What? Oh, my mother, you know, she says, she, always <laughs> says what it, she used to say she's given up now. Why don't you write nice stories? She said. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's because, you know, the very first story I had in print was a horror story. And she was there at the launch of this anthology that I was in. And more than one person said to her, what sort of childhood did she have? <laughs> Isn't that a terrible thing to say? Lynn, no, Lynn's always never, trying to get Derek to do it. pictures of flowers yeah. and stuff. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then, I don't think she's ever got over that. So, yeah. My mum reads all of my anthology and then tells me which ones she likes and which she doesn't. Well, that's good on her. My mum doesn't read anymore. She can't cope. Can't even cope with the covers of my books, let alone what's inside. Yeah. So, about what percentage of your book, your stories are horror, Jeff? Can you ju judge? I don't know. There's always some crazy stuff going on, and it sometimes it's scary. <laughs> I guess. I well, mean, so the novels all have an element of that, even though a lot of them are historical novels. You know what I mean? They take place in a specific past and time. All of them take place in New York. Those novels. I'm trying to. I'm trying to stay in that. I want to fill in the gaps as I go through and write more of them, you know, mm -hmm. of New York, because uh, I, I like that studying that, you know, past and so forth. But yeah, they all have some kind of horror stuff in them. There's always some creepy thing going on. Yeah. Even though it's just un underlying some earwax monster or something. So, well, you've always got some creepy thing going on. I really Especially don't like. Descriptions of people are just, I don't know, very creepy. I don't like unrelenting grimness, though. I mean, that kind of turns me off. Okay. It's just so, it's so like a lack of, uh, seems like a lack of, of a, not, I was going to say ability. It's not that, but a lack of imagination. It, it, it doesn't have the verisimilitude of life, you know what I mean? To make yeah. me care about the characters. You know, all that, there's a lot of those kind of, you know, splatter punk, grim shit. I mean, I'm not, I'm not into that. It's other people are though, so God bless them. <laughs> really grim, Jeff. What? <laughs> some of your stories are really grim. Yeah, some of them are, but not most of them. No, and there's always there's always people in there that you care about though, and there's moments of humor, and there's yeah. all that that 
other other stuff going on as well. I think that's really important as well. I don't want anything that's unrelentingly awful. Horror is just, big now. The, the difference so. between having a grim story and having horrible characters, all of them throughout, that's two different things. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. I think inflating them. <clears throat> I mean, you can have characters who you care about and still have horrible things happen to them. I and mean, that's actually in in a way, well, it's less satisfying. It's more satisfying in a way to have horrible characters have come to a horrible end. But but really, many stories in horror are good people come to bad ends. If you yeah. take somebody like Ligotti, I mean, I really find him humorous. I find his stuff really it's funny. Over to the top, it is. Very yeah. darkly funny, you know what I mean? And that I could deal with. I think that's great. What's surreal, uh, too? What's that? It's surreal. I mean, it's yeah. like, I mean, it's so over the top. I mean, it's, it's totally, it's not, a, it's not uh, believable as far as, I don't think, I mean, his stuff. It's more, you know, weird, totally weird. I, th I find it to be very humorous, though. I asked him a question about that. I got a chance to do this interview, and uh, with a, a bunch of people, we each got to ask one question. And I don't—I mean, I don't know his stuff that well, but I know from what I read. And he basically said, "Yeah," he said, uh, "You know," he said, uh, "That's true." I mean, I think that's true. What did he do? That is definitely humorous. Yeah, that there's a hum there's humor in it. Like it's definitely got some humor in it. I mean, it's like there's a lot of there's a lot of writers like that. Like Poe, Poe is fucking hysterical. I mean, really, and yeah. so is uh, you know, like Borges and those guys. They got they're all funny as hell. You know, I don't know if you're missing the humor in those guys, you're missing them. I think. Mm. What's that? What my, is that? My, my wife is singing because because her school's closed. She works in a uh, school. Oh. oh, I thought you had somebody wrapped tied up in the closet, Matt. <laughs> yeah, she's uh, her school's closed because she's they they open they close they're open they're closed. Yeah. I like your I like your work because it does have humor in it. Story. This story has it always has funny lines, even when horrible things are happening. Well, I mean that's life, really. Yeah. I've been at a lot of I've been at a lot of funerals with people that I know from when I grew up, and I go back, and I'm standing in the back of the even at my mother's funeral. I was in the back laughing my ass off. These guys I hadn't seen in years, you know, they were telling me about this candy store they owned where they had no air conditioning and all the candy was melting and shit. <laughs> I mean, I was I was in tears, and when my mother was up there in the coffin, <laughs> you know, yeah. <laughs> So I, I don't think I've been to a funeral where people haven't laughed at something. Like yeah. and you, you really need that. Like you laugh more, I think. You just you kind of really need that release. It's mm -hmm. yeah. something that makes you feel like you're a part. I don't know. Again, that back to, back to the community thing. Like laughing together is such an important thing, isn't it? It's, it's powerful. Mm -hmm. It is powerful. Oh, there's nothing like those moments where you've been hysterical. You're laughing so much. You're on the floor and you're crying with laughter and. Like you never, I, I don't know, I don't forget those moments when you, you know, somebody who you're, you're laughing so much with that you cannot stop laughing is a yeah. wonderful thing. Yeah, uh, I don't, um, yeah, when I have a really good laugh, I, I I really enjoy laughing until I cry and that's not so often. Yeah, <laughs> I don't remember that often. So that's why it's, yeah, it's, a, it's a great oh, feeling. Lynn, when that does here. Lynn says, Lynn Gallagher Ford says, that is definitely our life. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I think that might be a good note to end. We're coming up on uh, 9 p.m. Eastern time here. Um, this was great. It really was. Uh, really enjoyed uh, hearing you hearing your stories, and uh, this discussion was great too. And that's uh, been fantastic. Thanks so much for having us. If we're live again, I think if we can possibly maybe add a Q and A at the end. Time. Yeah, I think so. I think I think we should definitely add it to the in person but, readings. I think it's a good idea. Yeah, well, I love hearing when I'm when I'm been watching this. I love the Q and A part of it. I love hearing about people's motivations and all that sort of stuff. So yeah, it's yeah, great definitely. to see all these people who showed up for it. I thanks so oh, much to them, Linda and uh, Chris McLaren, and mm -hmm. uh, you know a bunch of people I know. Lynn, yeah. <laughs> hi, <you>. David. <laughs> yeah, it's great to the uh, the live yeah. event. And if you're watching this, you know. Uh, not live. Thank you. And uh, thanks to a couple people I saw uh, gave us some donations. So thank you as well. 
Yeah. Um, thank you. We'll, uh, we'll see you guys. Uh, we'll see you next week, uh, next month. Uh, for to be, uh, <laughs> but uh, hope to see you, Jeff and and Karen, um, in person. You know, hopefully soon. Oh, right. Yeah, fingers. that would be wonderful. I'm coming um, to New York as soon as I let me. Good. <laughs> All right. Good. <laughs> Yeah, right, so I'm going to end the live show, but uh, Jeff and Karen, hang around. We'll do a little uh, debrief here. But uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us, and uh, we'll see you next month. Thanks so thanks much. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for, thanks for coming. Thank you soon.